Welcome to the Sensible Socialist Podcast, a podcast for the rational left. We need to unite and work together if we're all going to get through this. Sounds like socialism to me. The amount of people I see talking about socialism positively is actually staggering. Do you think, we, I mean, do you really think that, we, that a, a proletarian revolution is just around the corner in America? Grab your pitchforks and stab your mayor. Little hero Obama. He's not my hero. I'm a idiot. Trump. Trump. <laughs> if Bernie Sanders were president, right, and he wanted to bring the same ideas as social, for socialism into this country, don't, do you think that would be a benefit? I just told you Venezuela is eating rats. But I just want people to have health care. I don't want, like... <laughs> well, Same thing Hugo Chavez. Oh, my God. You people have, like, worms in your brain, honestly. Welcome to this episode of the Sensible Socialist Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, and with me is now Sensible Socialist veteran and um, DSA Reform and Revolution Caucus member Brandon Matson. So Brandon, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Cool. And so um the uh among other things like having played in a band together and stuff like that, one thing that you and I share is at least some modicum of time in a I guess a a Leninist organization, maybe more obviously a Trotskyist organization, but that's another thing I want to kind of talk about in terms of the connection between the two. But uh, mm -hmm. that was, at least in my view, um, committed to a kind of Leninist party and project and taking a lot of lessons from uh, the the Bolsheviks in in Russia as a kind of revolutionary example, I guess, if nothing else. And and a lot of learning a lot about it and how it, um, you know, succeeded and where it failed and what and sort of really understanding that. And I think trying to take lessons from that and apply that to the current situation that we exist in, particularly here in the United States, but internationally as well. And mm -hmm. it's uh, it's been, you know, through the course of for me, at least, and, you know, being in, involved in sort of leftist things from from when i was like 15 years old um i've heard a lot of different perspectives and this focus on lenin i think is is uh has always kind of confused me not that not because there aren't important lessons to learn from you know vladimir lenin but how applicable a lot of what lenin thought and did and talked about is currently applicable in the sort of modern period, particularly in the United States, to kind of hone it in on that in, in this time and place. Because I think even Lenin would have argued that what he was talking about was very particular to Russia in the late Tsarist period or in you know the sort of post-liberal revolution-ish situation uh and in very much only about that in terms of at least the revolutionary tactics because i think there's two divisions there's like leninist lenin the marxist theorist and the role that he plays in sort of advancing the philosophical position of marxism and the revolutionary politics the revolutionary tactics goals strategy and um project and I think that I don't really have a lot to complain about in terms of his contribution to Marxist theoretical work. I think that the addition of understanding the growth of a kind of state capitalist system that will then allow for and facilitate pretty naked imperialism in order to extract resources to feed a kind of monopolized system that is embedded with the state and like how the state facilitates that relationship and may not it may even not overtly conquer an area and claim it for itself but may do so via you know entanglements with a kind of layer of bourgeoisie in that place what we would call kind of neocolonialism i think lenin would just call imperialism and so i think that that's yeah that's useful and applicable and i think that there's not a lot for me to like complain about i think a lot of that still 
is what maybe we would call neoliberalism. And I think that, you know, you, there's this imperialism that if you just read the fucking book cover, you know, imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, there's a kind of built in argument that's like, well, that's wrong because there's been this World War II period, which obviously Lenin didn't talk about because he was dead. And, and then this like post World <laughs> yep. War II, you know, neoliberal kind of building of an order that seems to be the real kind of maybe what we would call late stage capitalism model where it's like, I don't, you really don't know how it's going to get out of the position it's in, you know, other, unless descending again into fascism, which is, I think one thing that it does feel like there is a gap in, in Lenin's maybe theoretical work is how you can get kind of fascism. I think in some ways, and this is some rambling, I guess, but Trotsky does a good job at kind of trying to understand the development of, um, fascism via, I think, a kind of Leninist Marxist, a Marxist Leninist, as as difficult as that word has become to disentangle from the socialism in one state kind of project. But I think, and there's obviously the an argument that the structures of Leninists' revolutionary um, project were also useful or used to create the ultimate stalinist bureaucracy that would drown the revolution in its kind of own blood um so uh and i and i it's, it's sometimes difficult for me to argue against that because i see the, a certain kind of power in that and so i have uh, and then so there's the there's the initial reaction in me in terms of just like trying to even define leninism is difficult because there are these two components so if we're talking about leninist marxist theory i'm cool if we talk about the revolutionary theory, I think that's very applicable to Russia at that period of time in that certain situation. And then ultimately, like with a giant world war that's killing millions of people that like really is a pretty revolutionary moment evoking experience for a country. Um, and so if I think about its applicability, just kind of in a general broad stroke sense to 2021 second year pandemic you know 13 years or 16 years or whatever away from 20 2008 you know this major crisis in capitalism um no necessarily like world war kind of situation there's obviously a lot of different places where people are being killed but it isn't brought home in that sense where it creates a kind of revolutionary moment there is obviously frustration about the pandemic but again it just seems not like the same situation that Lenin was dealing with. And so I'm just kind of curious to talk to you just about this in the sense of what the fuck is Leninism really? What is the, what, like, what is its applicability in the modern, in the modern period? What should we take away? What should we get rid of? Um, is, is Leninism, you know, is, is it, is Marxist Leninism meaning Stalinism understanding Leninism correctly, right? There's so many things that are packed into this idea of even trying to define what is Leninism and how it imp impacts people's thinking. I don't even know where to begin. So maybe to me, just like, what do you think it is? Well, okay. Yeah. You've, you've laid out a ton of stuff, so I'll try and, uh, uh, boil down what I think um, sort of the essentials are, and I guess I would start by saying I do think the primary thing that defines Leninism is just it uh, is just consistent Marxism. I think, like you know, since ever since Marx and Engels first formulated their ideas, you know, I think there's been in every period since then a sort of wrestling with of different forces to try to sort of um, claim the mantle of like who is who represents the sort of genuine consistent thread um going down through history carrying the ideas methods of Marx and Engels forward in time and sort of developing them and, and adapting them to a new period um helping to to finish uh, or not finish but continue rounding them out um and so I would say you know in my view that in his day you know Lenin was sort of um one of the prime examples of people that that were carrying, in my view, the the sort of true flame of of Marx, Marxism, um, 
down through history or whatever. And that was true even, you know, I mean, the, the Zimmerwald conference is, a cer is certainly like a striking representation of that where you had, you know, the vast majority of self-proclaimed Marxists um, in Europe sort of um, having, having gotten in line behind the imperialist war machine of World War I and the you know the collapse of the second international and and so you know the number of people that were uh energetically organizing in opposition to that well claiming to be marxist like could have fit in two stage coaches or whatever mm -hmm. and so um and so you know i think uh, first and foremost to me leninism is sort of yeah it's that even when it was just a tiny uh, uh, candle burning in the in the darkness or whatever, sort of trying to carry the torch of of Marxism forward. Um, and as an aside, I'll just add that you know you threw Trotskyism in there, and I would say in many ways I would say a similar thing about Trotsky that like the, the in many ways his main thing was carrying the ideas of Lenin and Marx forward after Lenin died in a way that I would say is most consistent. Of course, all of these figures had. Had their own theoretical contributions but in many ways it's the consistency um that is the the hallmark in a way um and i guess i also would i guess i wouldn't draw i would i would draw a line between theory and tactics but i think maybe i would you would you didn't make explicit where you would draw that line so i can't say this for sure but but I think I might draw the line in a different place than than you're drawing the line implicitly in in posing the question. In that, um, because I, yeah, from my studying of Lenin, almost none of what I have gathered from that like is primarily around um, what I would call like purely tactics or whatever. I mean, certainly there are things like that, but but even but when you're studying the tactics, it's more like. Um, here's the method that was used to arrive at this set of tactics in this situation. It's not like you're just importing the tactics, you know, in any direct way or saying that you should copy those from, from then to now. And so I would say it, um, that said, I think when you, when you talk about things like what is the model of how a revolution is carried out or something like that, like, I, I think that goes beyond tactics. I think that is, that is still in the realm of, of Marxist theory of like, um, and is bound up with the question of of the state and what it means for the the working class to take power and overcome the capitalist state and things like that. I think you know those were um, those are things that I would say are generalizable and are are not sort of um, just situation based. That as long as you still think what we're dealing with is the, is a capitalist state, then the the sort of fundamental tasks of uh, the working class in that in their movement for power are are very similar. Whether you're talking about um, Russia 1917 or or U.S. today, of course, there's differences as well. But I think the more fundamental piece is the similarities. And so I guess I would throw it back to you in some ways on the tactics question of just trying to sort of clarify what are the types of tactics you're thinking of when you're like questioning are they still relevant to today. Um, cause I think that might sort of <laughs> help me uh, zero in more on, on what you were hoping to get at. So look, like, as a preface to that, like there is a sense in which I, I can understand the, the use of a kind of, th a, a kind of theoretical, see, I just think that there is, there is these two major strands in, in Marxism that I do see as, as not not super divided, but informing one another, right? So there, there's this kind of like the whole notion of like praxis, this combination of a theoretical understanding with the way the world is actually working and how those kind of entangle with one another. And so I think that you can say that there's a kind of focus. I, I'm, I want, I'm teeing up the question back to you of saying, I'm curious about what, what these gen, even generalizable methods, what you would consider some mm -hmm. of those, like an example of those to be. I think that what at least happened in Russia, um, I mean, you know, it's, it's always important, I think, to understand in terms of the history of like 20th century socialism to, 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 to be a bit stagist and to say, look, there is this process of development from 
feudal systems into these kind of liberal bourgeois systems. And they come at different times in different ways and in different places. But there is this general trend. And the difficulties of the industrialization process without this, like, man, like managed through a kind of feudal order, um, brings countries who are trying to do that behind other countries who are letting capitalism develop with its bringing into existence some of the institutions that are very helpful for it to thrive but do facilitate massive amounts of exploitation and all of the kinds of things that are both good and bad about the process of developing industrial bourgeois capitalism in a in an in a otherwise advanced feudal state and so like the analysis of Russia's small working class, its large peasantry, its very short like industrial and, and kind of capitalistic development in the sense of having even a small um, capitalist class and a fairly large, not fairly large, but, but a, an existent nobility that was, that was still granted all kinds of power, feudal kinds of power. So you have this really unique situation that was not useful for Russia to compete with other imperial powers in which it was trying to compete, losing wars in Japan, causing, you know, setting up, teeing up the ability to have a revolution in 1905 that was more liberal, trying to establish these. But these, this is, this is, you know, 50 years behind other, other places doing this kind of process. It's, it's very late in that process. And, and Lenin is already well playing a role by this period. I mean, Lenin and Trotsky and the you know, major players of the Russian Revolution by 1905 are very much already using a th theoretical approach to orient their tactics and you know, creating and, and, and leading Soviets, you know, actual workers' councils and things like that. I mean, that's obviously kind of, I think it, that, it, that to me feels like the most direct line to Marx and Engels revolutionary i'd push back on the cre on the creating part i don't think uh they created any soviets i think they just i mean i think creating them as a as right. a as a maybe powerful i think it was in leadership effective leadership on the part of particular members of the party which may have been crucial to developing them into more than just an organization of workers but into an actual political force again using that kind of i think revolutionary the revolutionary kind of perspective how do you actually win the kind of situation that you need to for the working class to take power because again i think again capital is not a book about how re workers can take power really it's a guide in order to understand the system in order to be able to understand its flaws and it's and what it what it's what you want to retain and what you want to get rid of and all these kind of things but it isn't a doctrine for revolution I think there are other places that you get closer to, you know, documents intended for revolutionary use. I think a lot of the journalism and things like that is definitely towards that goal. And there was obviously participation on the part of both Marx and Engels in actual revolutionary events. I think mm -hmm. in some ways like Lenin in revolutionary events that were a step behind where they were, where they had already understood a lot and, and wanting wanting kind of desperately to jump over periods of development and that not usually working and i think that being a very important like framing of the situation of the russian marxist project because the fact that it's done like a lot of the kind of theory and organization is done from an, an emigre and you know or imprisoned population and it has to be underground because it's it's illegal. It you have you have don't really have really existing bourgeois institutions in which to do things. And I mean, when you do, there was at least an engagement with that to a certain degree. I so like uh, to me, it the 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 quick and dirty answer though are things like the Vanguard Party, the need for it, this small the small highly advanced layer of the of the working class leading the kind of rest of the working class into a position of power 
um, there is there does feel like a difference between that and the kind of self-emancipation of the working class that I think Marx, you hear a lot in Marx and Engels in terms of this like process of understanding itself as a class and being its own kind of revolutionary force. There seems to be, at least in Lenin's understanding of what needs to happen in Russia, probably for the conditions that, that I mentioned, you need a small group of highly dedicated professional revolutionaries who create a newspaper, distribute the ideas of that newspaper, and help to connect workers who are, who are to a certain degree, self-organizing in order to be able to turn that self-organization into a political force to take actual power to institute the institutions that will be necessary for workers' control of the means of production. Um, that, that kind of necessity to me is, is where I don't, you know, where I wouldn't see it as applicable. And so if you bifurcate mm -hmm. Lenin's ideas from what he proposed for Russia in the period of time that he lived in and the methods he used to create that kind of, um, position, then I don't have a, I, I think there is understandable reasons why he made those decisions in Russia. I don't think that we should take his manual of organization for our time, only this theoretical way of understanding the importance of understanding the time, place, and political and socio political economic situation that you live in, right? We obviously have a different situation in terms of racial and the intersection of race and class in the United States in a way that is different in the Russian empire, but you do have, you know, what would become, uh, other state Soviet states and the inclusion of those, you know, and representation of those for that kind of purpose. You know, this is again, very particular to the position of Russia and what would become the Soviet union. So, so I'm, I, I'll say all that to throw the question back at you and to say, so what do you think are these, <laughs> these like Sounds big good. overarching things that are not the particulars of like the Vanguard party in a very, you know, um, Jacobin way, one might say, but more the, the informed sure. Marxist sure. revolutionary. Yeah. And well, so just the, yeah, put my cards on the table. I do think that the Leninist model of a party is still is still uh, correct today. So I'll I'll defend that as part of what's um, you know at least largely generalizable. Not every single like policy adopted by the party or whatever, but the general model of organization, um, the general sort of approach. I would I would defend that as part of what I think is still still applicable on top of all the the Marxist theoretical stuff. Um, so actually, yeah, just to, to jump into that, I think the, um, let's imagine for a moment, you have a mass working class movement that, uh, is in a period of upsurge and it goes and it tries to, um, change the status quo or it tries to emancipate itself from its current conditions. Um, you know, you could point to actually plenty of movements that have a character like that over the past century or whatever, but um, whether it's the movement uprising against uh, Mubarak in Egypt or, or something like that, these certainly didn't have uh, any sort of vanguard party, revolutionary party, whatever you want to call it, at, yeah. at the helm. Um, More spontaneous and so kind of events. I think, yep, and I think... So for me, actually, one of the things that another thing that's common to all these many examples throughout the last hundred plus years is that virtually all of them have not resulted in the working class actually taking power. Yeah. And the one that did, uh, although, as you we all know, um, it was short lived in a way, uh, at least the democratic uh, rule by the working class was quite short lived and, and quickly, um, degenerated into a Stalinist dictatorship. Um, it nonetheless was the, the first example in the 20th century of, um, the working class taking power in a country. I mean, the first example and, and in some ways only example ever of the, the working class, um, in a democratic 
organization, like taking power uh, in a whole country. You know, obviously had the Paris Commune, which is also even more short lived, but that was in a in a city. Um, and so I think that on, on its own sort of merits um, Bolshevism or Leninism, like to to be looked at quite closely uh, in terms of like what went right there that went wrong in so many other cases. And so, yeah, if you do have these spontaneous movements that sort of rise up, you certainly don't need a vanguard party for that. Like you'll get to the point, like, and I don't think Lenin would have ever argued that you do, um, you know, you, you, uh, you have um, capitalism itself is, is uh, crappy enough that you're going to have people trying to rebel against the, the status quo um, at some point or other. But what always happens is you reach a certain point where there's an impasse where it's because it's spontaneous. Most of those people have not sort of thought through the theoretical questions of what are the tasks of the revolution and how do we carry them out and whatever uh, they're, they're sort of flying uh, blind, flying by the seat of their pants and, so you hit a certain point where you're like, okay, we um, went on all the strikes and we occupied all the things, and uh, now what? Did we like we won, or what's the next thing that happens? And unfortunately, I think that kind of um, it lapse in of the initiative when you sort of have to pause and figure that out. Real revolutionary situations don't afford you the time to do that because if you uh, let the initiative fall into uh, someone else's hands, they're going to lead it in a different direction. So in Egypt, you get, uh, if the movement doesn't have an answer to that question, um, the capitalists are, are more than happy to pop their heads in and say, well, here's what's next. We have an election coming up and you can vote for the Muslim Brotherhood guy or the state apparatus guy. And uh, All right, go. And even if people sort of... Uh, have a vague sense that like more should be possible, um, which they usually do. Like there's, it's not that people just are like, yep, sounds good. They're like, no, there really should be some better other way. Um, but if they just don't know what it is, um, or if the people, well, oh, anyway, there's another point related to that I'll get to, but, but if they don't know what it is, then yeah, you're gonna, um, just end up falling into, well, I guess that's what, that's what's on offer. That's what we have to go with. Um, and but usually it's not um, it's not that there's no leadership. So that's the other uh, piece I wanted to get into is that if you imagine that Marxists are not contesting for um, a leadership role in these things, um, that doesn't mean other forces won't be. Um, so you know I think the search for leadership when uh, trying to carry out something like this is an organic phenomenon. I don't think it's some invention by Marxists or by Leninists or whatever. Um, and so inevitably, the forces that end up um, taking that role are sort of end up being misleaders, and whether it's because they don't know what to do next and they're, they're also groping in the dark, um, or whether they're um, actively like, I'm not actually interested in a revolution. I just want to um, get these sort of minor reforms. And so uh, I need to figure out a way to manipulate the these people to accept those and go back to normal. Um, or some combination of those two things. I think that is a story you see over and over and over and over again um, throughout history. So to me, uh, the sort of just let the working class self-emancipate itself ignores the... the um, the organic process of leadership as part of that self-emancipation of leadership development as part of that emancipation. And so if you don't challenge for that leadership and, and playing that role, I think other forces are going to fill that role and do a worse job. Um, and so I don't think it's a question of, yeah, sort of artificially setting oneself up as like cr creating this vanguard party thing um, out of the blue, but it's more like, okay, we're Marxists, we have this particular set of ideas about how to take things forward. There are other forces with other sets of ideas. So those of us with this set of ideas, let's get organized and let's try and win people to those ideas, get the solidest core together we can so that um, 
we stand the best shot at actually being able to to win um the leadership um win the the sort of um get get people to to put their trust in you to try picking you up and using you as a tool for their revolutionary um spontaneous revolutionary project or whatever um and uh so yeah i think and and actually just to this is the last thing thing i'll say on this for the moment but i think on the vanguard party thing i think that concept is sort of that that phrase and that concept is a bit um misunderstood in in uh modern political circles largely in that the vanguard party wasn't like the concept wasn't we i.e people who understand marxism um are the vanguard and the leaders are or and the workers uh, need to follow us or whatever um it's more a recognition when they talk about the vanguard of the working class they mean that organic leadership layer that exists like in any workplace you can see it like where you know some workers just are more thinking about political stuff are more active um and like in, at times when the rest of the workers aren't and so um those end up being the people that are sort of the natural organic leaders that end up getting looked to when, when shit hits the fan and people start trying to change things if there's a suddenly a movement towards some sort of labor demand some sort of strike um situation or union organizing or whatever that you instinctively look to those people the idea behind the vanguard party is we want to win we want to politically win that layer of the working class to our ideas so that when the working class moves into action um you know we're able to essentially be um we're able to have political influence among and organize among the the organic leadership of the working class who then will in turn be the sort of wheel that turns the broader working class and is able to move them into action because um even then the broader working class is not going to like that whatever they have no reason to go they're going to trust their organic leaders they already know not not you randoms um who've read books or whatever um so i think yeah that's a, that's a bunch of stuff i'll say about the vanguard party yeah so i mean he, like the the there seems to me to be um, something about the, the the vision that you just painted to me is the most idealistic version of this kind of argument, right? Which is to say that there will be in the course of class struggle, the emergence of like leaders who will, but, but uh, like, and, and that's true. That's like, that, that happens like, right? Like you have people who, get politicized and they get radicalized in the course of like a thing that really affects them, then they connect it with a larger, a lot of other things and it opens up their eyes. There's a lot of people who have that experience. Mm -hmm. It isn't the case. I don't think it's the case that that experience as radicalizing as it can be provides always the best groundwork to become involved in a Leninist party. Because I think you know this as well as I, that the process of actually becoming what would one might be called a cadre member of a devotely, say, Leninist kind of party, a vanguard party, let me say, uh, is um, the process of political education and making sure that the person understands the theory as expressed by the party. And I think there and and you would hope that the party would have mechanisms internally, which would allow it to be fluid and come to different conclusions based on different situations through that kind of analysis that hopefully does run back to Marx, as we talked like that, you can argue Lenin had. Um, but again, this is to me ideal, like very ideal, ideal circumstances would create a party like that. I'm not sure that any party has ever existed that looks like that and actually functions like that. And I, and honestly, certainly not ones that would, I think, adhere to or self-proclaim to adhere to a kind of Marxist-Leninist model or a Leninist model. And so... But let me argue that that actually was, I actually would say in Lenin himself, like the Bolshevik party absolutely did end up playing exactly that role in Russia um you know the soviets were not a creation of the bolsheviks they existed independently they were thrown up 
organically in the course in the course of the workers movement mm -hmm. um and at first actually the bolshevik um the the um whatever the the wider base of cadre in the bolshevik party like were were uh took a sectarian attitude towards and they saw them as competition and were like, not nah, whatever, like um, to sort of poo pooing them. And Lenin had to like forcefully convince the party to like reorient strongly to these, to these Soviets and was like, no, these are like the embryo of a thing that could take power in the future. These are where the organic workers leaders are. And, and so they did, they oriented to the Soviets and they went in and over the course of, you know, years of, of struggle, um, I mean, not that the Soviets were in constant existence during that time, they were in existence for a while in 1905 or whatever, and then came back um, in other, yeah, when revolution came about again, they're not sort of things that exist in, in stable periods. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it was a period of, of uh, having to build up and win um, the allegiance of the leadership of the working class as organized in the Soviets. And so I don't think it's made up or idealistic at all. I think it's exactly what happened in, in Russia. I think, yeah, but the, the, under the circumstances that existed in Russia at that time, and I think, again, the party, and that again, still, the party that we're talking about doing that was a party that had a long internal tradition significant barriers to entry and a kind of mandated political education in order to even be a part of it that we those of us who have had the experience of being in an organization like that are familiar with and so i i think again there there seems to me you know when you were talking about the kind of democratic period of of Soviet rule, we could say, um, when it was when the when the the revolutionary proclamation was all power to the Soviets, right? That to me is that that heyday of the Russian Revolution in terms of actually turning it over to the workers so that the workers could own and control the means of production. That is not like as you said, that does not last forever, and it it does become. I would argue, rule by the party. And the party becomes its own institution because of, it, it, I think because of the process it went through before 1905, from 1905 to February of 2017, and then from February to October. I think that there, that the, um, that, there was a period of time in which there was a kind of period of worker control and an organization of the means of production, but it became that party, that structure that was able to hold on and, and take courses and place itself in pivotal moments and periods of revolutionary struggle in Russia that could seize, the, seize a moment it had and did seize that moment it had but became the official leadership institution of a giant multi-ethnic, multi-state like organization that produced incredible things in the course of it doing so, but did so based on this complex structure from the party that I think leads down to the Leninist vanguard party with its leadership role and a kind of like larger base that doesn't have as much of that capacity that inevitably builds itself out through the process in, that happened in Russia, the civil war and the consequences thereof. We can talk about all of that being legitimate reasons why there is this kind of decay, but it becomes a problematic institution, I would say, in terms of um, democracy and ownership and control of the means of production in the working class. There becomes this notion that the working class owns and controls the means of production through the state ownership of the means of production and party control of it, and or some kind of weird vicarious ownership and control of the means of production, which I, which I just don't recognize as being such. And so... Either the argument goes that it's because of the, per the particular historical circumstance of 
this happening during the course of World War One, the Civil War afterwards, and the and the kind of economic and other frustrations that the early Soviet project had necessitated this move that was walking over the precipice you couldn't, you know, you couldn't walk back into. It was opening Pandora's box and you were never going to get it closed again. Like, is that how you understand? Do you do you disagree with me about the connection between those the, the <laughs> party of Lenin and the party of Stalin or the sto- the party of the Soviet Union as it was built rather than the sort of Soviet or socialist republic in Russia? I mean, I think they're two different things. I think that there's an actual historical development that you can't disentangle those two things, the, the party, the Bolsheviks, and then the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So I think I largely disagree. Uh, I think there are points, individual points, I agree with you on in there. Um, and like, so for instance, I think that, of course, like it is a historical fact that the uh, Communist Party came from the Bolshevik Party and the Communist Party became Stalinized. So yeah, in one way or another, somehow it did, you know, uh, one, one led to the other. But I think, yeah, I would say the primary catalyst for that development were the primary catalyst was the particular situation in Russia on the ground at that time and not some sort of um, inevitable evolution from a Leninist party model. I would add that the the very fact that you wound up with like a one party state um, was itself sort of a historic accident in a way, um, in the sense that like that was never part of the theory that was never like i mean stalin tried to turn it into a theory but but that was never like part of the plan um however given the reality of okay you're waging a fight to the death against uh, invading capitalist forces from two dozen countries or whatever and um uh, together with the um ex czarist and ex kerenskyist or whatever forces um and every other like socialist uh organized trend or whatever or supposedly socialist or whatever has like taken up arms against you and is sabotaging your project like um that's sort of not a situation where you can be like okay like yep we're just gonna all resolve this democratically because that that option has been taken off the table and so i think a lot of what happened was that you had these sort of extreme uh, temporary measures that got ossified um, as a result of the fact that there wasn't adequate internal democratic life um, after the taking of power and the winning of the Civil War. But I think that was also largely due to, to circumstance in the sense that on paper, the like organization of the um, Bolshevik party and of the the constitution of the Soviet Union uh, in those early days, like it was the most democratic yeah. constitution you, you've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, but in reality, like a lot of it wound up being hollow shells because, you know, a lot of the most advanced workers, either they were, they got killed fighting in the war or they like were needed for various other things like there's weren't enough to go around to fill the the posts that were needed and to sort of well still sort of like leaving people at the the factory level and stuff to like engage in robust democratic bottom-up processes and then a lot of the mass of the workers were more busy worrying about like how am i gonna eat and how am i gonna find work and whatever than they were like how am I going to like politically have my voice heard in this uh, structure? So like you had these very democratic institutions that were not actually filled out (laughs) with participation and largely owing to the situation. And I think like, um, and so, yeah, I think it's very connect, like one of the foundations that you need for socialism is 
actually being able to provide everyone a comfortable standard of living so that they are have the time and space to relax and think about these political questions and have their voice heard and whatever. That was not the situation in Russia. And so you could argue like, okay, well, that was a theoretical failing of the Bolsheviks. So they didn't see that that was coming, but, but actually they did. They did say that that was coming and, and said it very explicitly um, and warned well ahead of time of that issue. Um, but it wasn't them that decided like, we're going to have the revolution now. Uh, revolutions are bigger objective processes that, that are taking place, uh, whether you want them to or not. And faced with one, you can either say, I'm going to try and help it win, or I'm going to stay out of it and not do that and say from the sidelines, you're making a mistake, it's too early or whatever. Um, and I, I think all Marxists in the genuine tradition of Marxism throughout history, once something's an accomplished fact like that, um, go all in and say, yeah, I want to try and make this thing win, even despite these warnings. Um, but but also, I think they were clear about the task that, you know, the only way that you were going to be able to have genuine socialist democracy in Russia was if some other country, like, was able to join them and, like, so they had a trading partner and people to to like share resources with and yeah. whatever. And in particular Germany. Germany, since it was a much, yep, much richer country. And so like, uh, that's where I would say, yeah, it was in many ways you can, uh, blame the German social Democrats for Stalin. <laughs> um, in my view, uh, it's very connected, you know, what happened in, in Germany, uh, the failure of their revolution, um, I think directly allowed the ossification of the, the, Russian uh, regime because they were left isolated. And I think that, um, I mean, I, so all of that isn't to say like, oh, every decision that they made was perfect. And like, we need to just like see that as a model or whatever. Like, no, I think, I don't know, like, it's tough because it's, it's not a situation that has been like, you know, scientifically replicated or something in some other situation where you can like test an experiment, whether what the outcome would have been if they had done this or that instead. But I think what's clear is that it wasn't enough, like that, that it was just a, the objective situation was preventing setting up the sort of like ideal regime that, that they were wanting. And um, so they had to sort of hold on to try and be <laughs> rescued by revolution somewhere else and do whatever they could to help that succeed in the meantime. Um, but this is where I yeah. this is where I go. Okay, um, in defense of Leninism in Russia in nineteen seventeen, you know nineteen oh five to nineteen seventeen. Let's say okay, like and understanding its uh, degeneration. Always a fun in into whatever one calls it, whether it's a degenerated worker state or a state capitalist uh, situation. Applicability to now. Um, going back to kind of, you know, it, your argument sounds to me like we need, we still need a Leninist party. We still need something that looks like a vehicle by which you can, uh, you can help lead or help connect the most advanced and, uh, leadership playing leadership role playing members of the working class as it self engages in the class war with their employers and the state that represents them. Mm -hmm. The question I guess to me then is that what does the revolution look like? Um, because mm -hmm. if you're in a czarist state, this needs to be a conspiratorial organization that's doing all of this kind of under the ground and like, you know, smuggling shit in the back of cars and like doing all this, you know, spy shit that we would think of right now, right? Like all this kind of like crazy evading the the censor and all this kind of stuff. Now, not in, in this is in no way to discount the COINTELPRO and other kinds of infiltrations and, and destructions by the United States government over the course of several different kind of generational struggles. But it is nominally, at least, 
there is a space for a socialist party that could run in elections, mm-hmm. gain political power through that, you know, socialist alternative that like has a elected member in Seattle city council. There is the possibility for using the vehicle of bourgeois elections to gain a certain kind of power and influence in terms of policies that are made on the way to like on the sort of reform wave to a revolutionary change. Um, I think it's very possible and ultimately likely that a large socialist party will like in some ways, Germany get elected and get power and, you know, have Mm -hmm. a, have governors and have, you know, have like solid majorities in States that they can institute social democratic policies that would Mm -hmm. greatly advance the situation of the working class in the, in the United States. And then that would make it popular. And it could, it could, if, if properly led, let's say, move in the direction of talking about some means of abolishing the cap, the capitalist relation, the, the, the capitalist employee, employer, employee, capitalist, bourgeois, uh, proletariat worker dynamic by essentially abolishing private property ownership. That to me is a kind of revolutionary moment. Now, the way in which you abolish private property in the so in the, the Russian experience is a lot different than obviously winning elections because although there was some participation in elections, not all of them were won, um, which is part of the reason why you had the shutting off of parliament in October of 1917, because it was that was a, there was a more convenient way to assert the mantle of power, and so those kinds of differences in terms of um, what is likely going to be the project of the revolutionary change to move us in the direction of a genuinely classless society in which there isn't the division of employer employee is likely going to look a lot different than. The Russian revolutions in 1917, and so um, it seems to me that we can understand why there was that Soviet project, and understand that our conditions are very dissimilar, and we're going in a different direction. Which I think we should, as like Marxists, I think we should recognize that we're in a different place in time. There is a strand that connects, mm-hmm. but it's under it's very important to understand where we are and who we're talking to and the working class that we're dealing with, especially in the United States, the kind of working class is different than the developing working class in Russia in 1917 or the German working class in 1919. Or, you know, I I think that so uh, Mm -hmm. that's all to say that I think uh, the necessity for... So why is the Leninist model still relevant basically yeah i mean it just like given all that at most what you need to understand from the history of say russia and stuff like that is to be able to have a kind of easily mobilizable self-defense force to innate to enable you to defend your revolutionary project against the forces of counter-revolution because that's obviously something that's going to happen has to be part of the revolutionary theory i think you're right was part of revolutionary theory in in many places that were revolutionary you know cuba and other places i think had a very understand a a clear understanding that once the revolution is like takes hold it's in immediate defense mode against counter-revolution which inevitably comes so i think you need some kind of self-defense force but do you need this this uh hopefully democratic but at least at least centrally organized conspiratorial um sort of what we more commonly think of as revolutionary kind of party, more illegal and doing things that would not be considered legal political activities. Um, Is that organization necessary in the period of time that we live in, given that this, the likely change away from employer employee relations is going to be some kind of legislative act that is able to be enforced by some kind of layer or mass organization of the working class that will be able to do a kind of general strike or whatever would be necessary to show their power. You know what I mean? I just don't see the cadre vanguard party as useful or necessary given that we're not in there. 
We're not in Russia now. So there's a lot to to respond to there. I think um, the on the question of the sort of underground conspiratorial thing, I would agree that does not correspond to our current situation. There is no need to be underground and conspiratorial. We should not fetishize that. That is an adaptation to particular situations. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say that the capitalist class couldn't crack down at some future point and make a bunch of crucial democratic stuff illegal, at which point we would have to adopt more of those methods. But mm -hmm. whatever democratic space they give us, we should use yeah. and and not sort of um, romanticize the, the underground struggle in the way that, um, yeah, I think some trends on the left still do. Um, and and yeah, I think that's that is not part of what I would consider Leninism and would not be, I, I think Lenin was absolutely for using every democratic opening that existed. That's why they ran candidates for these super reactionary Dumas that like definitely were not, did not have any prospect of playing the role of a revolutionary transformation agent. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, it still offered, you know, um, a democratic avenue for um, getting ideas out to um, the people and for the voice of different struggles and things like that, even if they weren't going to be that. Oh man, your mic is cutting out like crazy. Democratic socialist party. Oh man. Looks like I lost my connection there. Yeah, yeah. Am I back? Yeah, you're back now. I'm back now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I don't I don't necessarily agree that the most likely um path for revolution today is that you have a big um democratic socialist party uh that gets elected through bourgeois elections that is able to administer um a a regime of progressive reforms and then sort of builds toward a point with those reforms that um, you can institute um, a capital, uh, an overthrow of capitalism by legislation. And then at that moment, you know, you is when it sort of triggers the crisis and you, you uh, have to mobilize the defense forces of the working class or whatever to uphold that decision against the resistance of the capitalists. I think. That's one possibility, but it's one among many, and I think it's it may not even be the most likely um, for the reason that I'm skeptical that the capitalists would just go along that long. I don't. I think it's very likely they would pull the trigger on their uh, violent resistance much earlier than that. They're not going to wait till like, oh, okay, you have this whole thing organized where you're ready to like consolidate and take power. I think they will try and use violent means to sabotage at a much earlier stage. So I think that is, mm. that is one reason I think it's not likely to go that far in that way. Um, and history another reason I think it's not, that, I mean, that that's what history <laughs> shows. Um, and I guess another reason is that I'm not convinced that they wouldn't um, make the system uh, prohibitively undemocratic, uh, long before then either like to basically rig it to the point where you can't win um in their system and that you have to seek other means of having genuine democratic um expression i don't again it's not ruled out i think it, but but i also think there's reason to to question whether it's sort of the way that it that it will happen but either way i think even then there's no way around the need to like if marxists come into power like if a Marxist got elected president or something, like their number, their task immediately would be to try and start dismantling the state. Not after a period of like, oh, I'm going to administer for a few years or decades or whatever capitalism in a nicer, better way with reforms and whatever. I don't. I think that's utopian. <laughs> I think that uh, not only will the capitalists not stand for that, but like um, it just 
the yeah the logic of the capitalist system will kick in and you will be faced with the question of of whether you're going to do transformative stuff or or not and i think like um i think that was the awakening that syriza got in greece when they came to power or whatever or the awakening they unfortunately didn't get was that you you can't just like oh we're going to stick within this system but do it better like they were confronted with the question of like okay well are we going to say you know screw it to the whole like eu and european banking system and like break with them fundamentally immediately or are we going to institute austerity and um you know they put it to a referendum thinking that people were going to vote oh no we're too scared of doing that you should do austerity instead the referendum didn't go that way it actually went right. no you should reject austerity but then they did the austerity anyway <laughs> um and so i think the uh um i think we have to be very clear as marxists about this question that there is no principled way that you can come into power in the executive of the modern capitalist state and administer it um in a way that's like beneficial to the working class and will get you popularity and whatever over an extended period of time i think that a marxist coming into power immediately poses a crisis a question of of rupture and so if you don't already have soviets or something like it uh, workers councils on the ground that's one of your other tasks is you need to build that up as soon as possible start trans transferring as much uh power to those institutions as you possibly can and away from um parliament or congress or whatever the official um governing bodies are supposed to be under bourgeois society and put it in the hands of those bottom-up working workers organizations as quickly as possible um and i think if you don't do that you are going to be stuck um to, uh administering a uh a bunch of shitty policies under capitalism and you're going to get blamed for it you're going to eat the historical blame for it and deservedly um so so i think it's actually very tricky i don't i don't think that it's nearly as easy to do it that way as as some people think um however i do think it's very possible um just not the only way i think the other possible way is you get something like france 1968 or egypt um 2011 or something like that where you start instead of starting with first someone gets elected and then you have to rapidly scramble to to build the bottom-up structures um instead you start with a mass movement um on the streets that brings in millions and uh sort of upsets the the status quo and and forces a crisis and then out of that you you sort of end up having to consolidate um power where you know in the in the case of egypt like you know um you could have said like okay out of all these striking workplaces and occupied public squares and schools and stuff like that um you know what we're going to do now is uh we're going to elect representatives out of each of these and form a new um council and that council is going to put out a decree to um or whatever a call to the to the um surrounding areas and cities and uh urging them to do the same and send their representatives um you know we're already organizing key things like security and public safety and and uh sanitation and feeding people and whatever anyway in these mass occupations let's systematize that let's turn that into a new government um the president's already stepped down there's a vacuum we shouldn't give it to one of their candidates we should fill it ourselves um as working people and have a regime that serves our interests i think you know sort of um carrying out those tasks in a rapid decisive fashion um when the when you still have the initiative in that situation i think is is another way and um in my view per, you know perhaps an even more likely way um it's still likely that you would have some people elected um even if you didn't have like majority control of of uh, congress or to have the presidency or something like you would still probably have a, a good chunk of socialist people elected by then um and you would want to use the positions for everything you could to but but it's primarily for the purpose of dismantling the power of the the capitalist state um not for for trying to wield it so i think like 
just dismantling as much of the army as you can, as much of the police force as you can, handing power to, to these workers' organizations, um, and nationalizing as much stuff as you can, as fast as you can, um, basically just trying to take all the weapons of economic and military terrorism as you can out of the hands of the capitalists. Um, but I, I don't see it going in some peaceful evolutionary way that then only ruptures when you when you decide it. I think I think the crisis will not be forced when we want it. It'll be forced sooner. But then, if you think about using that perspective, the the goal or the the right move for the dedicated Marxist is to you're not we're not even in a situation where we're not in a kind of mass upheaval moment despite the fact that we probably should be because of the pandemic and we're not we're not partly because it's forcing us to stay inside and not consolidate into large groups of people and engage it with one another in those kinds of ways um but also because I, and i think that it's having it's you know it's been just a, a slog for everybody i think you know the idea of becoming like politically, uh, you know, active uh, in the sort of post-Trump era and all this kind of stuff, like, you know, things are supposed to be returning to normal and all this kind of stuff. So the organization of anything resembling the vehicle by which you could have dual power and some kind of challenge to the status quo state structures to me is far far from where we are now and if and like the real position to me then is we don't even i mean we don't even have the social democratic party that can begin to pull away more radical elements of the working class from the bourgeois the the like the pretend social democratic party um so uh like there there is there is going to be a number of significant crises that are going to happen in the near future coming out of covid and dealing with mm -hmm. the effects of climate change as they will continue to worsen and things like that that will demand an action that it appears to me that both the working class and whatever leadership of the working class there are in terms of the socialist or let's say leninist left uh, is pretty dire. Um, do you, you know, I mean, even in France in 1968, there's a longer tradition to be able to connect to that feels very, uh, distant for Americans right now. I mean, you know, the, the heyday of the communist party was like 80 years ago, you know, and it's, it's not easy to see I mean, unions are not really radical or, you know, there's like, there's a couple examples you could make, but it doesn't feel like we're anywhere near prepared in a way that even would be useful to have this perspective. You know, what do you say to the person who might be, you know, that I'm asking for a friend, uh, you know, is kind of burnt out from this whole process being the fact that it doesn't appear to be moving the needle forward. And when you do see something like DSA as at least something that appears to be building in momentum and growing uh, in interest and potential power, um, you know, that makes that makes wanting to join a small cadre organization to be professional revolutionaries a lot less enticing than trying to be part of the steering mechanism of the large mass organization that may at least mm -hmm. help the snowball roll a lot more than a small Leninist party. What say you? Yeah. So first off, I think, uh, well, actually I'll address your last thing first because it's fresh in my mind. Um, <laughs> so nope, never mind. I'm going to go back to the other thing. Sorry. I keep turning over <laughs> in my head what order to tackle things. Um, Okay, so first off, walls. it's a good thing. I know, yeah, sorry. Um, I, it's a good thing, in a way, that uh, the mass movement is not at some 
uh, stage where it's about to challenge for power. No, I don't actually think it's good, but but there is the silver lining to that is if it were trying to challenge for power tomorrow, it would lose. Yeah, yeah. Like, is at that point, it is too late to build your party that is has the ideas capable of bringing a revolution to fruition. A, a revolutionary situation does not afford the time to build a conscious Marxist uh, understanding of things or whatever like it and uh, conscious like the, a leadership that's conscious of the tasks that need to be carried out. It needs to already be ready and waiting um, when that situation arises or you're already screwed. So that's one thing um, is I think like uh, it is not less relevant, but more relevant to build that now before we reach that stage. Um, and, and actually this is where it might seem like, oh, I just wish things would hurry up. But in reality, I think we're in a race against time and that we're going to get blown past by events um, and totally not have any organization <laughs> ready um, to lead the struggles uh, in the way they need to be led. And I think that's, that's occurred lots of times throughout history. Um, in, in the vast majority of cases, when you do have, in the first instance, whether it's an uprising or even just a, a workers' party, um, like in, in more peaceful times, the, the leadership in the first instance is thoroughly reformist and not up to the task. Um, and I think that's the most likely perspective is that no matter how well we do, um, it's very likely that in the initial go of it, uh, the leadership will be reformists who will sell the movement out and tank it. Um, because that's what always happens, it seems like. Um, and it's only through trial and the trial and error of like, okay, well, we tried the way that seemed easier. So now we have to go to the somewhat more left people and then just keep going into like picking up the working class. Like they're like striving for this thing and they're like, oh, well, let's pick this more, most reasonable, easy looking thing, the path of least resistance. And we'll do that. And then that doesn't work. And then you're like, oh, crap, and back to the drawing board and whatever. Some other crisis hits years later. And you're like, okay, well, now they suck. So we're, we know they suck. We tried that. So we'll pick up this other thing and just kind of, um, I think there is going to be a testing and a sifting like that, that that's gone through. Um, but, uh, and, and so to me, um, the key thing is that you have some force that's capable of being one of those alternatives once the others are are exhausted and, and trying to skip those stages if you can but but knowing that you often can't um i think like objectively if we succeed in forming a workers party it'll be led by by reformists um the the uh and so to me the question of should we have a like do you need to organize as a small cadre organization of marxists is the same thing as asking, do we need to uh, preserve the ideas of Marxism and advocate for them in the movement? Because you can't do it as isolated individuals in a reformist mass. Like you're going to, it, no matter how, whatever, maybe there's some heroic individuals who can stick it out, but like the vast majority of people uh, as an atomized person in that uh, atmosphere is going to lose their Marxist compass, is going to adapt to that atmosphere and the tremendous pressures that you come under. Um, and so to me, like being, being a, organizing as a cohesive, tight knit, theoretically rather homogenous um, Marxist cadre organization is not counterposed to organizing in a mass organization like DSA. To me, they're intimately linked that you have to do both things um in our day at least you have to definitely do both things because we don't i think unlike a lot of the past periods you don't like just have these pre-made like mass workers parties led by reformists and the only task of the task of socialists or of marxists is just to like sort of um, is, is to challenge the reformists for leadership, essentially. Um, that's in some ways the simpler task that that uh, was the case in, in earlier periods, at least in some countries. And I think today in the US the and in basically every country around the world, like 
that is not the situation. We have we have a double task that that uh, we have to deal with um, of not only building up the sort of Marxist um, cadre to challenge the other leadership within this pre-existing uh, party, but we have to also be building up the basic organizations of the working class, the the trade unions, the party organization, whatever that we're that we're trying to also challenge for influence within. So it's a monumental task and it's, it's not easy, but, but to me, like the only reason to like, to me as a conscious Marxist, the only reason or way to join something like DSA is as like with the project of building a core of Marxist ideas within it and trying to, um, trying to gain influence for those ideas, gain um, uh, a following for those ideas within this, this broader organization. And that means being organized to do it. And so uh, to me, there's just the practical tasks of, I wanna win this bigger, broader organization and movement to these ideas means those of us who agree on these ideas, we should get together and get organized and do that as a conscious project. To me, that's sort of, common sense and and why wouldn't you do that <laughs> okay but how how much agree i guess is like th this will be like honestly my like the last kind of bit of it because i think this is the, an important part of it too you have a lot of different groups who will have even this general perspective um there is a persistent history of splits and splinters and disassociations of people who agree on like 98% of the same, like literally 98% of the same thing and have one minor disagreement that results in, um, because of the, I think the, the nature of the organizations will ultimately leave. And there seems to be, um, while I don't disagree that it's necessary to kind of build, um, you know, this Marxist, this like Marxist element of the working class and to organize in a mass party like DSA in order to identify who may be uh, receptive to it. But you did mention uh, theoretical homogeneity and mm -hmm. that um, there is partially, I think for me, dispositionally, um, I've always had difficulty with the the homogeneity um, of some organizations, um, that there is what one might call a party line, and that party line must be towed in order to be a part of the organization. And if you are not sufficiently agree in agreement with that position, then you are effectively not part of the organization. Um, I mean, I think partially just because my views have shifted over time, and as I get into more conversations and read more and experience more as a human being engaged in working class life. I learn new things and come to different understandings. And so I don't always fit uh, neatly into the homogenous intellectual communities. And so you have this issue where uh, there is a certain amount of intellectual homogeneity or, or theoretical homogeneity that you'd want. But you'd want that to be wide enough to be able to encompass what is now a significant, diverse collection of people who, again, agree on 99% of it, even on like the kind of Marxist part of it, not just DSA big, but like the Marxist left is, you know, divided amongst itself pretty, pretty amazingly. Um, what like this also was not some, I mean, you do have, it's Bolshevik, you know, because of a not necessarily a split, but kind of a split. And it's a division of a part of like the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party into kind of two parts, you know? And so this is even in terms of its relationship with Leninism, a long standing Leninist tradition of fuck you, like we disagree on fucking who should be a member. So we're all going to leave and start our own party. Like fuck you guys. And like, there's been this well. Long... Just to be fair, it wasn't uh, not in, in not in their yeah, sense. I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm saying that there can be what can be, like 
theoretical disagreements that embody themselves in parliamentary kind of decisions that that ultimately mm-hmm. are like the reason for the split or as i think we've experienced too e- interpersonal acrimony may also re- like lead to these splits that where there's a kind of link between people's theoretical disagreements and their personal relationships which tend which tends to sh- tatter especially organizations that tend to be dependent on leadership in a way that other organizations are less so, like more a mass organization is less so. But I, I like, again, this is saying a lot, but this has been something I've noticed. Uh, this And this has been something that's kind of difficult. And so there is a sense of how much intellectual homogeneity are you, or sorry, theoretical homogeneity are you talking about uh, in terms of what's necessary for an organized Marxist left? And why do you think there's so many fucking divisions and why can't the, these groups get together, not even just through like DSA, but even a kind of, you know, like you've already you've already ruined Syriza for me. But like at least the notion of a <laughs> a a sort of unity of the radical left, the more Marxist left, right? In, in, in a sense that isn't isn't taking power for the purposes of uh, fucking over the the work the vote of the actual people. Which again, I think one of one of Syriza's problems was that it wasn't uh, its leadership was not sufficiently. Um, radical enough to actually listen to a democratic will which again in greece is a grand irony but i think is is a situation where there were there were a number of people who left syriza because of that decision because obviously that 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 party was not theoretically homogenized in terms of what it was going to do if if there was a a no vote on the referendum and i thought so that like that's a kind of aside, but a, a unity of the radical left on its major Marxist agreements, I think, would be helpful in, in terms of in going into an organization like DSA, finding the people who are organically being thrust into a position of, of leadership, both inside DSA, but even outside DSA. You'd be able to do that more effectively if there was a more cohesive um, organization in which everyone can participate, learn lessons, engage in the same kind of work, and and be a bit more comradely, which I think is not always what you get on the more radical Marxist left. I think, uh, yeah, you make valid points and I think that there's a reason, but, but actually your own points in some ways give the answer in the sense that, um, the reason I'm not united, for instance, with all these other groups on the Marxist left is because, as you said, the culture in most of these Marxist groups on the left is not the culture of the group that I think we should try and build yeah. Um, yeah. as a tendency inside ideas. And I don't think that would be when people to these ideas or be an effective organizing method. And so yeah. they obviously like, aren't. if they would agree to you, if they would agree to unite on our basis of the way that I think we should organize, then absolutely. And I'm sure <laughs> they would say the same thing in reverse right. that, that, you know. Um, but, but yeah, I do, I agree with a lot of your critiques of most of the Marxist left as being overly, um, you know, there's a party line and, and like, to me, that's a distortion of, of, uh, genuine, uh, Leninism to say that like, oh, to, to have it be a, a prescriptive sort of, uh, unity where it like is, is the leadership determines a line and then everyone has to follow it. Like, no, it should be, um, The opposite of that, I think it should be, I mean, I think ideological homogeneity is good, but it needs to be on a basis of genuinely convincing each other of the same things. I think it's aspirational. It's what you're, it's what you want to try for, but I don't think it should be prescriptively uh, enforced from above. Mm. Well, at least in terms of uh, existing members, I think like it's one thing if you're recruiting new people in, I do think the existing members like need to make a judgment call of like, okay, what's how, just how much agreement do we need before we bring someone in as a member? But, but I think once someone's in and is a member of the party, like they should have just as much democratic right as anyone else to argue for what the line of the party should be and that you should have robust internal um, debates and disagreements about that when there are, like, I think if there are differences, they should not be cracked down on and, and cased up. I think it should be the opposite. Like you should, you should, every time there's a, a theoretical disagreement, like that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for learning and growing and, and developing um, as Marxists. And you should um, like have 
sharp but comradely, friendly, open debates on these questions. Um, you know, I think along the lines of the conversation you and I are having right now, I think like I think this is a good dynamic and the type of dynamic you'd want to be able to have in a party like that where you can have frank open conversations like i think this is bullshit and no i think this is fine yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever and you can just have that mm-hmm. you know while still being friends and mm-hmm. comrades um and i think like uh yeah so anyway i i do agree that that's a, a better model but precisely because i think a lot of people don't want to follow that <laughs> that model uh it makes it hard to unify in a common organization if if you would not be able to maintain that model. And so I think the splits that you see on the left, I think there's, there's a historical reason for all of them. Like they were all, there was always some issue posed some uh, like if you, yeah, sort of trace the threads, but I think the big, the, uh, the big splintering that creates the, the sort of, uh, Trotsky is left at least that you see now. And I'll admit to not being like the best sort of, left sectologist or whatever yeah, like that's, I, that's a weak point of mine is i have not studied all the little trends and what the yeah. you know what like i, I mm-hmm. yeah that has never been my focus so um i'm speaking in generalities here but the um but i think the big splintering was after uh, world war ii ended because trotsky had predicted that with the end of world war ii there would be a revolutionary wave across europe um in which uh, socialist ideas would again come to the fore and, um, you know, would, there would be a crisis of capitalism where, where basically there just, there'd be another opportunity in countries across Europe for there to be, uh, revolutions. And, uh, I mean, the revolutionary wave did actually happen, but the, but the, they got misled yet again, (laughs) um, in the sense that, uh, in most of those cases, it ended up, you know, the, the socialists that ended up at the helm of that attempt um, were, were reformists who sort of immediately proceeded to hand power uh, to the capitalists again upon being thrust uh, into that position. Yeah. And so, um, and, and so that, I think, through, I think a lot of people had an overly dogmatic view of, of Trotsky's predictions as like things that, like, anyway, like, in my mind, it shouldn't have caused such a crisis that that like this thing didn't work out exactly like you thought it might. But like it was ridiculous to the point where there were some trends that were like, "Well, World War II actually hasn't ended yet," or is the conclusion we have to draw because if right. it had, Trotsky's uh, uh, prediction would have come true. And so, like clearly, it's still ongoing, and and he was he's right. We just need to. <laughs> anyway, so there's that level of denial going on and and weird stuff like that. Um, but, but I think that was where you got a big splintering is the sort of crisis of how to interpret that. And I think ever since then you have not had, I think like, that was the last time you had sort of a, a center piece of the, um, like thread of genuine Marxism, like, uh, on a world scale or whatever. Like, I think since the fourth international, you haven't had anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think, so part of that's historical and like, you know, uh, maybe with a resurgence of, of, uh, mass movements, maybe we'll get back to something like that. The other possibility is that, you know, it's just so many more new theoretical questions have been posed since then that you sort of can't wind the clock back that, that like this differentiation is, is just part of the process. Like in the same way as, um, at, after the first international collapsed and you went into the second international, like, it's not like you can race the knowledge that there are now Marxists and anarchists or whatever, like Mm -hmm. that sort of, that was a split that, that sort of, uh, that's now two trends for better or worse, you know, that have their own ideological uh, basis. And I think that's true of, of a lot of the different splits on the left. Not, not all of them. There are some pointless ones, but, but I think it's true of more of them than you would think. Um, and, and so I do think the theoretical clarity is important, but I also think um, that uh, too many of these groups have gotten used to being sort of these sects that are on the margins of things. Whereas I think uh, that's one of the things that's great about DSA in my mind is it is this center of gravity where different 
uh, ideologies and forces can go to mm -hmm. and like yeah they don't all have to merge into one thing but you can all you can test your ideas out in a larger group of people and try and win win people to them and and uh it's sort of a, a ground for that and so to me it's that's one of the great things like you, in my mind you actually have more freedom to be extremely uh homogenous as a caucus within dsa in a way because i remember when i was in socialist alternative the the vibe was like if you met someone and like yeah they don't totally get what we're saying yet and but kind of it's close enough and we think that they'll listen to us so like we got to bring them in um or else they'll disappear and we'll never see them again um and i think like one of the nice things about dsa is you would you do have this broader thing that like well okay like we don't there's no rush to like recruit this person into our caucus because like we just we can still work with them in broader right. dsa stuff and just let the process take its natural form of like yeah when we when we've discussed enough and worked together enough that we feel like yeah we're basically on the same page um then yeah we can merge them into our group or whatever and and until then we can just have a relaxed approach of of having the discussions doing the work and and like going through that so i to me that's a really good thing about that and i think um that that to me is sort of the nice model that like yeah you you do want this ideologically homogenous thing just so that the ideas can be posed clearly um and sharply in the broader milieu and you can have good sharp discussions about what the ideas really um should be and have those arguments out in the open and and have those political discussions but but it's but if you but I do think it's a problem to be this ideologically homogenous thing that is a walled off sect in its own little world. Um, I think that is just asking for, for degeneration into, yeah, in all sorts of various ways. Um, when you don't have some other broader thing to bounce any of that off of, you, you get really weird you start distortions. Talking, you start to talk to yourself um, a lot, you know, and then you start believing your own yeah. bullshit. And there's not very, there's not always good checks on, you know, on trends that continue as trends because they're trendy and not necessarily because they're right. And yeah. I think that that happens in a lot of places. And I think, so like the Bolsheviks were, a, you know, despite their name, were a minority trend most of their existence. Um, the, the, they were a majority, happened to be at the Congress that the split happened at or whatever. So, um, but... And it should be noted, actually, that even, you know, I, Lenin didn't want the split into factions or whatever and was, you know, actually totally willing to, like, go back on all those decisions. He was super flexible on the organizational stuff. He was like, look, this doesn't justify this. Like, I find, like, you want to have it your way with the editorial thing, that's fine. You want to have that, like, these are not the crucial questions, but, like, by then, the whatever, uh, the Menshevik forces at that point were sort of already hardened against him and, and just, I mean, they took advantage of that in a lot of ways, actually, and sort of, okay, yeah, we'll take you up on your concessions, but also we're still going to wage war against you. Um, and so <laughs> um, I think, like, like, one thing I admire about Lenin is that he was extremely intransigent on theoretical questions and extremely flexible on organizational questions which is not his reputation, but I think is true if you read the record or whatever, that, that like um, what he did was use every single opportunity to hammer away at what he thought the right theoretical ideas were. Like every disagreement, it was like, this is an opportunity to argue my case. Like mm -hmm. he would rather have the ability to speak than to, than to vote. If he given the option or whatever, like he, he wanted to persuade people like he, more so than he wanted to have his way or whatever. And, yeah. and so I think that that was that it to me is absolutely the approach that that socialists should take is be extremely flexible on organizational things, but extremely principled and firm on on the principles on on the ideas. Um, and so I think like yeah, the Bolsheviks were a minority trend most of the time, but that didn't stop them from in the end being able to win uh, the leadership of the workers' movement. It just what it took was the workers first um, trying out the um, SRs and Mensheviks and and that government and like seeing how that went or whatever. And the Bolsheviks were careful, you know, not to take 
any executive positions in that government. Like they, they help to vote to put it in place. Like, you know, yes, we agree with having a, we, with having a uh, government. We, I mean, we, we think it should be an all socialist government. So that was one of their things was like, don't have an alliance with the capitalists have just the socialist party, even though we think you're reformist socialist parties, you know, go basically it was a way of exposing them in a way of saying like, you know, no, you should just, just constitute a socialist government. Um, and they wouldn't do it. Um, but, but yeah, I think, so it, I think it was important actually that they didn't, um, dirty their hands with, and, uh, the, like take responsibility for what the Kerensky government did and then didn't take a ministerial posts within that or whatever, or else I think they would have jeopardized their chance to ever have, have a shot. Um, but, um, but nor did they stand in the way of the Kerensky government doing its thing and trying, trying out its project. They, they knew that was an experience the working class wanted and needed to go through. Um, and so I think like, but that was what allowed people to then go, okay, I get what they've been saying about these guys. I didn't see the difference, like why these differences were so important before, but now like, you know, yeah. you see um, the actual experience of the SRs and Menchviks in power and it kind of sucks. So um, I think like, yeah, I, I think that we'll probably end up having to go through something similar in one form or another, whatever the institutions are that, that go through these experiences. It'll be, I think, uh, Marxists are going to remain in a in a small minority for quite a while, and, but then you can have an explosive, rapid growth in a very short period of time when the working class decides, okay, this is what we're going to pick up and try now. And that's sort of what happened with Syriza as well. Is that um, they 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 were a marginal party until they were sort of the ones putting forward a line that corresponded with where the masses were at or whatever and they were sort of just looking for a tool to pick up and try and use it's not that they had some deep relationship with Syria. they just in the moment were sort of like trying to do this thing and this was what was on offer and yeah. in a way i'd say that the same thing is true in a more limited sense in the, in in the sense of like corbin or sanders or something like that right, like right. It's not like Jeremy Corbyn did anything different that year than like every other, like the trend that he's a part of, like they just like take turns running for labor leader or whatever and have done so for a long time. And it's not like it's kind of a routine and expecting not to get much of anywhere. And like, but that year the conditions were just right. right, and, right. and people, you know, flocked to it. Um, and it's like, it's also what happened in a way with DSA and its right. explosive growth that, um, you know, they, they happened to be, they had certain key advantages of being not sectarian and, um, and being behind the Bernie Sanders campaign and whatever. And so like, they, they had just kind of been around sort of languishing for a while. And then like this moment happened where like, okay, the, all of a sudden their line sort of corresponds to where, where the broader movement is at and people just flood into it and totally transform the organization. And I think, yeah, I think you see that again and again. And I, I think that's also what we can expect um, Marxists to look forward to eventually if we play our cards right. So yeah, retain the organizational flexibility and but the theoretical rigidity, you know, um, which which maybe as a putting the a bow on it is a definition of Leninism, right? Uh, <laughs> just, you know, like a kind of strident, strident, theoretical positions um but but being able to put those in practice in whatever way moves the ball forward and any move any ball movement is towards towards where you want to go mm -hmm. yeah i think i think that is uh that would be a great uh way to look at leninism there's lots of ways to look at it and i think that's a good one <laughs> there you go all right cool man well i i appreciate it like i said uh um part of my thinkings on this have just um uh, have evolved and changed over time and, and related to both my experience in socialist alternative, but other socialist organizations that claim to kind of, you know, line back to Lenin via Trotsky usually. And um, it's, it's been something that I've wanted to talk to somebody like you about for a long time. And I'm glad we had the conversation. Me too. Yeah, thanks for making it happen. Cool. All right. See you later. See ya.
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Sensible Socialist Podcast. This podcast is supported by listeners like you, and no advertisements or anything will ever be said. If you want to support the podcast, please go to patreon.com slash sensible socialist and give today. Also, please give us a review or a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast, as it greatly helps. All right. See you next time.